Hey everybody, this is Dr. Ron. I'm super excited to be sitting here with Jennifer, uh, the CEO of uh, Nutrition for Longevity. And it's a really awesome company that uh, I had the privilege of visiting just earlier today uh, at this amazing farm, the most amazing farm I've ever seen with some crazy technologies I've never seen before as well. And the idea is to uh, create an environment where food can be grown uh, for the purpose of longevity, right? So uh, Jennifer, how did you get into this in the, in the first place? Um, so this is a little bit different of, uh, from, from my entire background. So I was born and raised in Alaska. I think that gave me a deep foundation and, and appreciation for nature. Um, my family lived off of nature mainly. Um, we did do some hunting and things like that, um, but nothing was ever wasted. And we mainly grew our own food and, and raised everything um, from scratch. So I had this deep underlying appreciation for natural foods, um, holistic foods, things like that. Um, I actually went to school for microbiology, biochemistry, and I moved into the pharmaceutical industry. Um, I did that when I was in middle school, my uncle died of AIDS, and that was in the 80s when there wasn't any standard of care and treatment for it. And I really, I saw him every day and I saw him deteriorate wow. and it immediately wanted, made me want to go into to medicine. How can I fix this. So I actually moved into specialty medicines. So I worked in AIDS, HIV, cancers, um, things like that in the pharmaceutical industry. And I loved what I did. I was actually involved in launching some incredible chemotherapy treatments, things like that. But I moved up into higher and higher levels and, and was at an executive level. And I just, I looked at the overall industry and felt like we weren't making the progress we should be making. We're spending the most on healthcare of any country in the world. In terms of like infectious disease or medicine in general? Just in general, our cost okay. of healthcare. Um, it, so it's the highest in the world, yet we're the only, only the 35th healthiest. And we spend the least on food. So I felt like there's really got to be a correlation there. Um, we're kind of getting what we pay for with our food and we're, it, it's, it's really impacting our health. So I wanted to take my business understanding and bring it, into that natural, my, my background, kind of going back to my roots of how can I bring this food and my experience in farming and um, really working with nature to nourish the body and get back into that. So my husband and I, I quit my job. Um, so I was an executive doing really well. It's, it's not like I was um, not doing well in my profession. I was doing very well, but I just decided this is where my passion is. I want to make this change. Um, so I, I quit my job and we bought a farm and we came, became farmers. Um, so our farm is a regenerative farm. We focus completely on food as medicine. And then part of our business strategy was always to create a meal kitting company that could then bring that food to um, people in a very convenient way so they could eat this fresh, um, really clean food to nourish their bodies. So it was shifting my medical knowledge um, and, and microbiology and biochemistry and switching it over to just a, a different perspective and a different way of looking at food. So you medicine. combine all that together, <laughs> form this passion project, which is now basically your everyday life, yes, right? Yes. And so you know, earlier in the farm, I, I you know, um, we were asking you, you know, what's work like? You're like, what's well, not really work, right? <laughs> it's something that you, you're passionate yeah. about it, and you're not really working a day in your life. So that's that's really awesome. Want to yeah. congratulate you on that. Oh, thank you. Especially coming from an executive in the corporate world into this completely different thing yeah. uh, must have been a very big decision for you and your family. Yeah. It was. It it was actually, I would say, I know everyone says it's kind of cliche, like, um, you know, it's almost fulfilling your purpose in life. But I have to say for me, this was something that I felt a deep passion for and I felt like it, it is my purpose. And so I actually fought it for a long time. I, I knew this was my path and it was really uncomfortable. Like, hold on, you're going to quit, quit your job and become a farmer. And every single person we told, told me I was crazy. Um, and I was like, and then I had one mentor tell me, if they say you're crazy, you're doing the right thing. Right. So I did it. And <laughs> I almost hyperventilated the day. I, well, I pretty much did hyperventilate the day I quit my job, but um, I knew it was the right thing. Immediately I went home and I was just right. like, I felt this huge relief, like stop fighting what you know is meant to be. So, so yeah, right. it wasn't an easy decision. <laughs> I mean, the word crazy, right? It's basically going against the social norm. Yeah. And if we were always going with the social norm, there's no room for us to grow. So, yeah. you know, and if you weren't crazy, you wouldn't be sitting here with me. <laughs> also, just as crazy, I think. Yeah. Um, but, but but in order for you to 
go from your roots with your family, the agricultural background, into microbiology, into biochemistry, into the full circle back. Yeah. Um, it's, it's so this farm that you have is really the the uh, the ultimate achievement that you have in your life, mm -hmm. right? So where do you see this going now that Nutrition for Longevity is live? Yeah. You're delivering food to people from soil to the table in just a couple days, right? Yeah. Now, what what is the best case scenario in the, maybe the next five years or the next 10 years? Yeah. And what do you hope to achieve with the farm? Yeah. So, I mean, one of the biggest things for me is not just to have this farm, but to create a food model. Because I think our our health industry is a bit broken. I think it's too expensive. We're our, our chronic illnesses are just going through the roof. So we're not gaining the traction I feel like we need to gain because we're looking at it in a linear way instead of looking at it holistically. But the food industry is very similar. It's also looking at this one way to do things and not looking at the overall system. So what we want to do is create something that's replicatable in multiple farms. So we want to expand. We're already looking at um, farms in multiple different states in the U.S. where we want to have a region for region model with our food. So it's not just this one thing and we're done. We really okay. want to expand. We want yeah. this to be something that becomes common across the U.S. and other farms doing it. And so it's something we want to also educate other farmers about. We want to show people you can get incredible yields off of a biointensive regenerative farm. Um, you can be financially sustainable if you do the right business models to be able to do that. And we can do this while reversing climate change. So it's something I'm very passionate about. And, and I absolutely believe from the data and what we see on our own farm that it's doable and it's very replicable, even in different geographies across the U.S. So you're building a system, not yes. necessarily just a farm absolutely. to exist yeah. in this place, yeah. right? So one of the things I did for about seven years in my career was I was a master black belt in Six Sigma and Lean, which is all about systematizing things. How do you make it replicable and easy? And farming's not easy. It's it's actually very complex. I actually think my degrees in biochemistry and microbiology help me understand how to grow the plants and the plant um, microbiome and soil biology and everything. And so the more you understand that, you can create these kind of modular ways of looking at things. And even though we have over 300 varieties on our farm, we look at them in categories and we can create these kind of block plans to be able to plan out a very complex farm and keep it rotating and having even companion planting and hedgerows and things like that. They're all things that we can now carbon copy and take and build up other farms even faster. So everything we've been focusing on is how to create, we create this closed loop system, like an ecosystem within our farms that we can take elsewhere. And as you saw, we balance um, this regenerative outdoor mm -hmm. farming with higher technology, because I do think there's advancements we need to continue to make. So we focused on aquaponics. I think it's um, one of the most sustainable kind of more techy um, agricultural practices. Even though it's 4,000 years old, we've kind of focused on how do we modernize that? How do we make it more efficient? How do we make it more cost effective? Um, so that goes into how do we create these models that we can replicate all over the world, not even in the U.S. So I'd like it to be something that we can share even beyond the U.S. in the coming years. So when I visited the farm... And I go in there, and to my left are these giant tanks with the fish that was in there. And you're like, you know what? The fish are pooping, but it's good because <laughs> yeah. it's feeding the plants, yeah, right? Yeah. And then the plants take out the nitrogenous waste that's in the poop, all right? And then that water goes back into into yeah. the fish. Yeah. And, uh, I mean, first of all, that's not something that I've seen before on that large scale. I mean, those yeah. are two huge, gigantic tanks yeah. that are there. Yeah. And the fact that... Um, not a whole lot of water is really wasted, mm -hmm. right? The only water that comes out is what actually goes into the actual mm -hmm. products, the plants, yeah. right? And so um, that system, uh, it seems very efficient. Do you think that can be replicated uh, in every yeah. farm that you develop? I, I do, and, and we intend to because um, I believe, so for one, it supports year-round growing. So in places like Texas, California, you can do a lot outdoor um, in New Jersey, as we saw today, it's it's very difficult outside, even mm -hmm. with protective blankets, everything. We have pretty harsh winters. So the nice thing with aquaponics is it's indoors, it's climatic controlled, so we can really um, use science to kind of make sure the environment is the best for the fish and the plants. And we can okay. grow crops that grow good in that climate. So we create a microclimate within that greenhouse. 
And, and that's important because I do think with food security, we have more natural disasters happening than we've ever had before. We have countries in the world that have such severe climates. It's very difficult to just say, to throw up a regenerative farm. It takes time in a lot of locations. So we believe aquaponics farming could be the sustainable solution for vertical farming. So we're looking at some different meshes to grow on that are natural meshes. Um, lots of different advancements and how do we make that um, more sustainable, more financially sustainable, um, where we can produce large quantities of food. So I'm, I never am one to put all my eggs in one basket. I want to show that you can do advances in technology. We're not going to just get left behind, but that the soil biology, that's where most of my passion is because I think it's going to have the biggest benefit to human health and to the environment. Um, but we do both just to balance it. All right. So we've been talking about the replication process and the business process behind this. But what's far more interesting is that um, the actual products, the actual ingredients are from these blue zones of the earth, yeah. right? Um, these uh, these areas in the world where people are the longest living and the healthiest, yeah. and you bring that to the farm. And I think where a lot of the food industry has been going is been trying to genetically modify organisms, trying to hybridize the strains for higher yield and less waste, right? And but uh, but you're kind of going against all that and mm -hmm. bring it back into into um, into history of saying, hey, let's get these naturally grown foods in these regions and bring it here. Yeah. And so that is a little counterintuitive when you're trying to expand on a business model in, in terms of farming yeah. of something that has been working. Yeah. So can you expand a little bit on that? Yeah. So, I mean, I think that. I guess what we would call modern agriculture, it hasn't changed that much. I mean, we've added more GMO and different types of fertilizers and um, a lot of more synthetic aspects into right. the environment. But as far as like the tillage and things like that, it hasn't changed that dramatically since like the 30s. Um, so I think there's a lot of advancement we can do with actually organic farming. Um, I think there's actually much more opportunity to grow in that area. Um, <clears throat> so I think for me, I feel like it's counterintuitive. Our current farming model, I feel like it's kind of counterintuitive. It, it seems mm -hmm. like we've gone away from some of the best things that were in agriculture before. And if I look at some of our, even our good yield, yielding crops that grow really well, some of our carrots, they're, they're thousands of year old varieties of carrots that are incredibly beautiful. People say, we love your carrots. They taste amazing. I've never had anything like this. So our yields are good. People love them. They're very low maintenance. They're easy for us to grow. Um, so to me, that's, that's intuitive. It, it's, it's healthy for the body. It ha it's packed with phytonutrients. It's a heirloom seed that we can continue. And I'm really interested in, you know, the holobiome of a plant. Um, and they say that the, not just the genetics of the plant, but even its own microbiome are also passed down in the seed. So I don't know what's going on when we're, when we're ad adapting seeds or, or how, even hybridizing too quickly, mm -hmm. are we losing some of that genetic makeup sure. that's part of this holobiome? And what's the effect on that? And then modern agriculture with monocrops, they're, they are showing scientifically that we're losing critical biodiversity in our microbiome for the soil, mm -hmm. um, that we don't even know what that's doing for us. We don't, we, 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 they say we know 0.1% of bacteria in the soil that we even 0.1. know. 0.1%. Wow. So if we know that little about it and we're already eradicating species, like that's concerning because we don't know what those are doing in a good way for our body. Right. Um, and so I just like to try to, I, I take the philosophy of do no harm. I mean, we try to do that as much as possible, you know, use no synthetic chemicals, really try to build up that soil and do everything we can to build up the biodiversity, which I believe creates healthy crops. We get incredible yield on our farm. So even though there's a lot of, People out there saying you can't feed the world with organic farming. With the amount of farms we have today, that's true. But you can do it from a model standpoint. We see the yields. Um, we see uh, if you do the right crop rotations and you use the right composting practices mm -hmm. that you can have really good. Our farm produces far more crops and by, by pound and by volume. And ours are the crops the least grown in the U.S. So 98% are more your grains, your corns, things like that. Um, over 70% of that is actually for meat, for growing meat. 
Mm-hmm. So if we actually consumed a bit less meat, we took more of a reducitarian type of diet, and then we wasted less food, we waste more than 65% of our food. I feel if we went after some of those things, and like we talked about earlier, we go b- back to the slow food movement and appreciate our food and savor mm-hmm. the food, we'd probably waste a lot less as well. Um, so that's part of the model and where I, I don't think it's counterintuitive. I feel like it's very much the direction we need to go. And I think it's what our bodies need. I think it's what the environment needs. And I think it can feed the world. I know it can. I've seen the numbers. So when I visit the farm and we were you know, tasting things and biting things off the plant, <laughs> it was a lot of fun, actually. Yeah. Um, you know, we noticed that the texture just seems so much better and the flavor is just explosive, right? Yeah. And a lot of the things is, is it's, um, yes, this is a carrot and yes, this is lettuce, but it's not like anything I've had before. Yeah. Right. And so, you know, I think our bodies, uh, tend to enjoy the things that's made for our bodies and comparing that to something that you just kind of buy out of a store. I mean, it's a massively yeah. different product to, you know, altogether. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And so I think, you know, whatever you're doing, continue. It's awesome. (laughs) Thank you. Um, Because that's a very different experience. It's like, you know, I'm developing a new relationship Mm -hmm. with this thing that's grown here. Yeah. And seeing the process that's involved really makes me appreciate each leaf on the lettuce, you know, each bite of the carrots. It's fascinating. So, but I want to talk about colors because we've been talking about colors all day and it's my favorite topic. (laughs) And so... We know that uh, our bodies have an amazing ability to heal mm-hmm. when we consume colors. So all yeah. the colors of the rainbow, right? And so um, we we consume the colors of the rainbow because humans can see the entire color uh, range of the rainbow, yeah. right? Red, orange, yellow, blue, indigo, violet. Um, because uh, you know humans have developed this trichromatic way of looking at these different ranges, so we can go uh, gather these berries and and these vegetables and stuff yeah. like that. Um, but, uh, when, when we, uh, when we utilize that, um, that ability, if you will, uh, to look for food, we're able to get the things that we want. Mm -hmm. But in modern day, it's 2019, we're so bombarded with artificial colors, right? We're bombarded with commercials and social media and it's, it's, it kind of desaturates our vision to, uh, to know what's truly good and not good. Yeah. But then when I went to the farm, it's like everything just kind of reset. I was like, wow, there's there's a smell here. Yeah. There's a color here. Yeah. And everything was so colorful, especially on like the purple and blue spectrum. Absolutely. Right? And these are the phytonutrients that our body needs to create the healing effect, the longevity effect. Absolutely. Um, uh, in a very short amount of time, you know, mm-hmm. people will eat this and no one's going to go home and have a food coma. Right? <laughs> and uh, you feel, you know, remarkably well. And even tonight when we had our food here. Um, you know, no one, no one is sleepy. Everyone is very vibrant. You know, everyone they eat a lot, and we're able to immerse in very good conversation, and the, and the mood is 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 very awesome. Yeah. So I think you know the the food that's grown there and the food that you're providing is not just food; it's creating a whole community and discussion, right? Absolutely. And so, but let's talk about uh, in terms of colors, because you and I focus a lot on blue and purple. Yeah. Let's talk about why that is in okay. the first place. Okay. So, yeah, I mean, I've always been really passionate, even when I was younger, of, of having all these different varieties of fruits and vegetables. Every time I've had a garden, a small farm, um, I've always tried to grow the most vibrant um, heirloom varieties. And I love them personally. Like, I just, I enjoy it. It's visually appealing. They taste incredible. You get this diversity in your palate. And I noticed it with my kids, too. So... If I put like five colors on their plate, they may not eat everything I put on there, but they enjoy consuming those colors. And if you look at, um, if I look at just the, the, the children's eating, because I think it's in kind of a crisis situation in the U.S. as well, most things most kids like are very muted. You know, we're, we're giving them pizza, macaroni and cheese, chicken yeah. nuggets, right? It's this is on the kids' menu. Well, I know. <laughs> it's kind of terrible. But, you know, yeah. if we put those in front of our children, even if at first they may, you know, turn it away. It's like we talked about the microgreens. My daughter loves the pea shoot microgreens. So, you know, I give her a lot of those. Mm. And there's different things, but she loves red bell peppers, yellow bell peppers. So I try to get her or purple be- green beans we offer. So we'll just put as much of that as possible and get it in front of them. And I think when even at, at children who maybe don't understand this conversation, they do understand mm-hmm. like th- this actually feels good. I ate this last time. I enjoy this. It has a pretty good flavor. 
Um, so maybe they're not going to eat the dandelions and stuff like that, but um, they'll eat these kind of basic ones. And then you talk to an adult, it's actually not that different, right? If you mm -hmm. put these beautiful colors in front of them, I think people are more apt to start eating that and, and realizing that healthy eating doesn't have to be, doesn't have to taste bad. It can taste incredible and it can be healthy for you. So, okay. So, sorry. Going back to the blue hued vegetables. Yeah. So, we focus very heavily on those because it, they used to be the most, one of the most prevalent in even the American diet quite some time ago. But at every longevity region we looked at had purple as a very predominant color in their diet. Um, so we focus very heavily on what are the crops that they grow in these regions. Will they also grow well in our region? And we mm -hmm. select those seeds that will, that will come from those areas and do well. And when we started introducing those in the U.S., we realized it's the least prominent in the U.S. Mm -hmm. So interesting correlation. And we like them. They're, they're super high in anthocyanins or um, cyanidins. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and, and that is one of the strongest phytochemicals. They're linking it to longevity. Right. Um, so it's one that we focus on to try to reintroduce it to the American diet. Because I do think it's one of the most important colors. Yet, like I said, one of the least prevalent. So um, there's other, we always try to like, like we both say, eat the rainbow. So you're not just yeah. overloading yourselves. But if you look at a lot of the superfoods, blueberries, blackberries, yeah. if you look at the purple carrots, the, it's just much higher. If you look at our microgreens, it's almost, you know, off the scale with these just super packed with these phytonutrients. Um, so we focus on those and then all the other broad spectrum colors that you're not usually getting in the U.S. We do have a lot of green, but it'll be like iceberg lettuce, which doesn't have mm -hmm. a ton of nutrients in it. So we try to, try to bring those other ones that are a little bit harder to find in the grocery store or somewhere else. Yeah, from a medical standpoint, um, the blue and the purple hue with the anthocyanin, uh, we know that it's associated um, with production of inflammation, mm -hmm. improvement in blood flow, improvement in brain function, improvement in heart function, and a whole host of different things. Yeah. Um, but the new data that we have now is that these uh, these different colors are broken down by the gut bacteria, and they became protein. And these little protein can actually affect the way our genes are expressed. So. You know, we may be born with the genes that we're born with, but we don't necessarily have to express it. And we can modify these genes with the actual colors that actually exist in there. Yeah. So it's beyond just, you know, proteins, fats, and carbs, yeah, or, you know, B5, B6, et cetera, which all, they're all great. Yeah. But the ability for, our, for us to manipulate our genomic expression with these colors is an exceptionally powerful tool that we have that we're completely underutilizing. We're not utilizing it at all. Yeah, yeah. And it, what's interesting is that's exactly what's happening in the plants. So the pathways, okay. they may be called different pathways, but if you look at the metabolic pathways of the bacteria in the soil and how they're feeding the plant and yeah. then our gut uh, microbiome and how they're feeding us, yeah, <clears throat> it's so similar. I mean, I, I don't know if there's a formal term, but I feel like we need to be doing more research of this combination of plant holobiome and the human holobiome like a universal biome mm -hmm. where we're starting to understand those interactions because if the plant is creating these phytochemicals as a response to stress and a coping mechanism and then it's doing the same thing in our bodies right like are we are we doing enough to understand that interconnectedness and if we're definitely doing detrimental things like bombarding ourselves with chemicals and killing that right. not in our not only in our own gut microbiome but in the soil microbiome like it's it's actually fairly frightening, like um, the impact it could be having on our health, um, all the way stemming to the soil. Right, and that's why you know I get a little crazy when the kids menu at fancy restaurants is like you know chicken nuggets and fries, which is completely devoid of yeah, color. Yeah. A lot of inflammatory things that are there, um, because you know why should the kids get that kind of food and the adults get this kind of yeah. food? You know, we're setting this expectation to them that that's what they're because. I mean, whatever you offer a child when, yeah. when they're younger, that, that's going to stay with them for their whole life. And, right. <clears throat> you know, that's why I like that concept of the holobiome, because it's looking at not only your genetics, but the genetics of all the bacteria that, you know, a lot of people don't know you have bacteria surrounding you in the air around you. Plants do as well. And so we're constantly changing that. Like you said, the, the bacteria in our guts, the bacteria in plants are actually changing the way they, they are, our full expression. Right. Um, and we're with our children already starting to adapt that maybe not in the right direction. So 
I think it's, it's really important. And I know a lot of parents are concerned about their children's health. They just, they're like, what do I do? And for me, I encourage them just start getting vegetables in front of them. You need right. things, berries, you're like, oh, I thought it was not good to eat too many berries. I was like, I don't think it's going to hurt your child if they have too many blueberries. I mean, okay, there's always an exception, but right. I know at least my children, they're not going to eat too many of any of the things. And I'll put quantities in front of them just to expose them yeah. to it. And they might say no. And I, you know, I don't usually force it too heavily. Um, and I'm just trying to get them used to that. So they know it's a part of a, you know, healthy eating. And I think that's right. Important. And the kids really have to get involved with the choices of the yeah, food too. Absolutely. You know, you go to the store and, uh, and say, Hey, pick out some purple, yeah. some red. You know, in the vegetable section, bring it back. Let's see what I can create yeah. at home. Yeah. I think that's a very important lesson to learn yeah. because that's my childhood, in, you know, yeah. in China, is that we went to the markets, we picked certain yeah. things, and uh, we played around with colors. Yeah. And that was, you know, just part of being fun. Yeah. Um, not realizing at that time how good it was for our actual health. Uh, and of course, in, uh, when I came to America, it was a very different scenario. And, you know, in I came to the U.S. in the early 1990s, and uh, no, you're not going to find a lot of the, the great quality ingredients that we have, you know, right now in 2019, back yeah. in the day. And so the, the, the culture shifted, yeah. right? Absolutely. And so, but uh, but it's great to, you know, because you, you and I are on the same team to bring that culture back mm -hmm. on the education process and cultivating a community where we're all talking about the same things, understanding the same things. And then at the same time, have it be sustainable and yeah. replicatable. Yep. So. Um, yeah. So thanks for joining us. We just had this incredible event. Um, we were here at Yandu Kitchen um, cooking with some Yandu in our dishes, uh, which is a plant-based essence that uh, can really give an incredible kind of savory flavor to a lot of plant-based dishes that you may, you know, if you crave a lot of meat and things like that, you could really replace it with this plant-based um kind of broth that we use in some of the dishes. And so it's it's got a great flavor and we did some cooking demonstrations with that and we talked about the benefits of healthy eating with a lot of fruits and vegetables, um, clean food and especially these colors and how to incorporate them into your diet and the benefits uh, to the human body of doing that. Um, so I think it was great. We had a lot of questions and interaction um, with, with the group that was here, a lot of dietitians and people really interested in this space. Um, and then earlier this morning, we were at our farm, just really looking at the crops, seeing how they're grown, um, looking at the aquaponics and understanding how that um, kind of symbiotic relationship works. Um, so I think it was a, a great start, you know, first yeah. time we've been able to meet face to face and really start building up, um, you know, this this common passion and vision together. So yeah, it was start. a great experience. And, you know, cooking here tonight and seeing all the beautiful colors mm -hmm. that's laid out there. Um, it was a great experience because, you know, we're eating and eating and eating and eating, but, you know, it's not like you get this brain fog or you get a little tired is that you just kind of pump yourself with energy the entire time. And, uh, and that's always an interesting experience where you're able to feed a lot of people, eat a lot of food, uh, share a lot of laughter, and everyone goes home, goes home feeling phenomenal. Yeah, right? yeah absolutely. And it's, uh, it has to do with all the colors kind of being in there. And, uh, and this is such a great space as well. And I think we had such a strong community tonight. You know, especially people who are really passionate about food as medicine and health. Yeah. And, and you know, being the physician here tonight, it's very um, humbling uh, to see this type of community getting together and being passionate about taking health into their own hands. So. Absolutely. Mm -hmm.